we are ahead of schedule and I visited with Ms. Andrews about that fact. Uh, we decided that folks probably wouldn't be unhappy about getting to break early or getting to lunch early or perhaps finishing early in the afternoon. Anyone against any of those ideas? That's what we got. Well, always try to be a crowd pleaser. So ahead. Our next speaker is Mr. Kenny Rebeck. Uh, Kenny tells me that he is a native of Louisiana. He currently serves as the Chief of Wildlife, his wildlife, sir, his wildlife. Chief of Wildlife for the Louisiana Fish and Wildlife Group. So State, State Department, he is here to give us an overview of DFCs and what they represent. Kenny, I'll turn it over to you. Well, it's an honor for me to be here today to present this to you. I wasn't the original scheduled entity, but I'm glad to fill in. Donald Lacasio was originally scheduled. Regrettably, you see what I'm dressed in, that's what he's dressed in, but he's out in New Mexico. Chasing that bird with the beer, which concerns me a little bit. A guy chasing an animal with a beer. <laughs> there might be a few of y'all in here that enjoy that as well. Anyway, I appreciate being up here on this stage today to talk to y'all. John Hodges and Andy Ezell, they've both been important players in, in my career, and most of the crew that uh, represents the uh, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, and as Andy said, most of the folks that represent the management of bottomland hardwoods within the Mississippi Lugo Valley. So it's great company that I'm here with. And as John shared some of his uh, points here on the management, one thing I learned early in my career, I started with the uh, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries as a forester biologist working in the forestry program. And over my career, <clears throat> I learned as I began to expand that program that coming over to Mississippi State University was very important to enhance and develop in that program because John Hodges was there, Andy Ezell were there, and these were the folks that were dealing with the research and the management, along with the Stoneville Forest Service folks, and really gave us a lead in establishment, management, monitoring, guidance on how we should manage these bottomland hardwood resources that we're responsible for. But today I'm here to represent the Lower Mississippi Valley Joint Venture. And I'm going to give you a little background on what we're here for, as Andy said, to talk about desired forest conditions. Let's see. The, talk of my, or the title of my talk will be Managing Bottomland Hardwood Forest for Wildlife, also known <coughs> commonly as Desired Forest Conditions. <coughs> So what is, uh, what, what am I going to cover? Well, basically I'm going to cover what the discussion is about. It's about this report that the Low Mississippi Valley Joint Venture published in 2007. And though the, the title, Restoration Management and Monitoring of Forest Resources in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, Recommendations for Enhancing Wildlife Habitat, it includes more than what I'm going to brief on because we basically don't have enough time to go into the other components, the reforestation and the inventory of monitoring. So today, in my brief, I'm going to focus on what the LMVJV is, to make sure that y'all are aware of that first, and then how we derive the DFC attributes. And then, just a quick overview of the management recommendations that are put forth in this document. <coughs> So what is the Lower Mississippi Valley Joint Venture? It's a self-directed, non-regulatory conservation partnership. It exists for the purpose of implementing the goals and objectives of national and international bird conservation plans. The partners here in the uh, Lower Mississippi Valley, those those uh, logos represent the state partners that are involved in the JV, and this is on the Joint Venture Management Board. <clears throat> Those logos represent our federal partners. <coughs> and then we also have 
some NGOs, non-governmental organizations that are represented on the management board. All of these players, all of these board members are out there on the landscape making, they're basically the ones that, in addition to our private members, that have the wildlife trust. That's our responsibility as a wildlife community that we are managing the wildlife resources within this area for, as a trust of our citizens. So, the conservation objective of the joint venture, basically developing landscapes capable of supporting sustainable populations of priority wildlife. What you see on the screen are copies of the covers of several plan documents that we operate under. Some of those are, are national plans, some of those are state, what we call wildlife action plans. These have been developed to give guidance to our land managers folks that are out there on the ground, on the landscape, responsible for specific public properties, as well as responsible for working with private landowners throughout the valley and other regions to manage for sustainable populations of wildlife species. How do we manage wildland harvests? <clears throat> well, as, as wildlife biologists, we sit down and we're, we're always focused, of course, on the populations of the particular species of concern. So we look at some of the models. You know, we have to know about the growth of that population. We have to know about ingress and egress. Well, all of y'all know, like when you go out to sample a forest stand, you're not counting every tree out there. And it's the same with wildlife. We're sampling. And these models help us to estimate what those populations are doing, if they're sustainable or if they're actually going in the <coughs> So these are things that we consider. But then we also recognize that sustainability of these wildlife species is basically a function of the landscape quality, how that landscape is situated relative to habitat that supports those populations, and then the individual site quality. And that's where it gets to what John mentioned in his talk, that we want to recognize that our manipulation efforts at that stand level is what's guiding the future development of those forests. Implications of restoration management. As John said, every time we enter a stand, whatever treatment methods we do, we need to know with fair certainty what the outcome of those are. In other words, we should be following objectives when we do our treatments. And we should know that our treatments are going to accomplish those objectives for us. As, as the wildlife managers, we're focused on, of course, making treatments that are conducive to enhancing, maintaining, and promoting those wildlife species of concern, their populations, in a sustainable manner. So landscape quality. <coughs> We look at block size and configuration. Now, when you look at the MAV, we all recognize the tremendous loss of forest resources that occurred throughout the valley, primarily for the development of agriculture. That is something that we're dealing with today. From a wildlife standpoint, uh, many entities were able to I guess step up to the plate. I look at my agency as we had good leadership during those times, during the 50s, 60s, and 70s that were, that had foresight and saw that the demise of the bottomland hardwood forest in the valley within our state was quickly going to be impacting some of the wildlife resources that were important to our citizens. And some of those leaders began to take steps to secure some of those properties that remain. Now, <clears throat> when you look at the aerial photograph or satellite photograph, I guess you should say, of, of the MAV, you see those remaining forest blocks. And, and most of those, when you look across the landscape, have some sort of public entity tied to them. What we've been doing over the years is, you know, as we address these plans that I showed you earlier in sustaining these national populations of wildlife species of concern, we have to identify where we have actually source populations.
where there's habitat that supports populations that are doing good and adding to the growth or the maintenance. And then we also identify where we have <coughs> sinks or those areas where most of those fragmented forests across the landscape that are actually draining the population because the population production coming from those areas is actually a negative. So <coughs> we developed decision support models. The, di the uh, diagram on the right, <coughs> if you notice on that, the focus there from a bird perspective was to build upon those existing forested blocks instead of to do a shotgun approach and, and go out across the landscape and restore a 40 year or a hundred there or a thousand here. Focus those restoration efforts, especially if it was public dollars, adjacent to those existing blocks so that we made a real difference in the habitat and being able to sustain populations of primary concern species. And then we talk about site quality. That's where we make a difference. And as forest managers, as wildlife managers, as John said, any land manager that goes out there and does a treatment is using, using some of these civil cultural tools that we've become accustomed to. And those are the tools that we all know help us to sustain the wildlife populations in that forest and across the landscape. So how do we, in, how do we manage the site quality enhanced wildlife habitat? Well, we gotta look at the forest structure. We gotta look at the composition of that forest and the vertical and horizontal structure of that forest composition. We look at where that forest is in the landscape. How, how wet is that forest? Why do we define desired forest conditions? Desired forest conditions provide us an explicit linkage between a species of concern and the habitat attributes that are necessary to maintain that species and to help it sustain its population as a whole across the landscape. So very much like if you had the opportunity to build a house, you wouldn't go to a contractor and say, build me a three bedroom, two bath house. You may not get anything what you were expecting. Instead, you go to that contractor with plans, with a blueprint, and those plans you're specifying some of the attributes, the attributes that you want to see in that house and that you're willing to pay him to build. <coughs> DFCs are very much like that. We're trying to help our land managers by defining certain forest metrics, forest attributes that are important to sustaining the populations of primary concern species. So DFCs, define the endpoint. It provides guidance to our land managers and it provides a basis for us to evaluate those treatments. All these forest metrics that we're fixing to talk about, if we have those measured and we know what we're seeking as foresters, as land managers, as wildlife biologists, we have the capacity with the tools that we use in our management programs to measure the impacts that our treatments do and make sure that we are meeting or attaining those characteristics that are important to these species. What are the desired forest conditions? They're going to vary. They're going to vary by the species. Here you have pictures of, of some of those species that are addressed. Bats, um, of course the most popular white-tailed deer, wood ducks, and other ducks, mallards in our bottom end hardwoods are extremely important. The eastern wild turkey, gray squirrel, Swainson's warbler, important bird, primary bird of concern. The uh, salamanders, and then woodcock. I don't know how many of you are woodcock hunters. Seems to be a dying breed, but for those that are that appreciate the bird, it's definitely a supporting little bird that's dependent on our bottom end hardwood forest many years. So I want to take a step back in time, look at how this DFC development came into play. Give you a little bit of history. There's a long history of forest management, but rarely 
have those management prescriptions been explicitly linked to the different wildlife attributes that are important for sustainable populations. In 2001, the National Wildlife uh, or the Fish and Wildlife Service recognized the need to have what they call biological reviews on the refuges. And in the process of starting this, something very important came out of that review process. Uh, one of those things, the easiest way to say it is, doing that review process, which involved a lot of in-house meetings and then going out to the field with a different uh, interdisciplinary group that evaluated what the refuge staff were doing on that refuge, meet the objectives of the refuge, was the biologists would in the field say, well, I need more habitat for swains and dwarves. And the forester, the one that would be creating that habitat, would say, well, Tell me what that is. Tell me what that looks like, and I'll create it for you. So what they learned in this process of biological <coughs> review was there was some terminology, some, some communication that wasn't happening between the biology side and the forest management side. And that's something that had to come together so that we could speak apples to apples. But in 2002, the USDA Natural Resources and Conservation Service contacted the service because they had an issue coming about with the Weather Reserve Program. They wanted to have some management recommendations or some guidelines <coughs> to provide to their staffing on how they would allow management of extant bottomland hardwood forests that they were allowing to be enrolled in WRP. The service uh, met in a joint workshop with the uh, USDA in 2002. A working group was formed, and from that working group, a white paper was developed, which basically ended up as this report the NRCS WRP Forest Land Compatible Use Guide, established in 2004. When this came out, uh, some of those state partners on the joint venture board queried our service partner, where did this come from? We have some concerns about, is this actually going to promote, is this actually going to allow management of those forest resources that will sustain wildlife populations? As wildlife managers, we had some real concerns. So from those concerns, the Lower Mississippi Valley Joint Venture Management Board created an interagency, interdisciplinary working group to further address and investigate forest management as it relates to enhancing the wildlife habitat. This group is known as the Forest Resource Conservation Working Group. The task that was assigned by the management board to the working group was that the group would strive to ensure that conservation actions and programs of joint venture partners reflect reforestation and forest management prescriptions and practices that sustain populations, priority birds, and other forest-dependent wildlife in concert with sustainable forestry. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> one of the first steps that that working group had to do was to begin to define the wildlife species of concern and the habitat needs of those species. In order to link those together, we had to go through literature review and look at what, what priority species, what were some of the limiting components in habitat for those species, identify those, and then identify quantities, amounts, et cetera, that were necessary <coughs> in our forests and across the landscape to support sustainable populations. So that explicit linkage of canopy cover, basal area. It was brought together for all those species. And through that, additional field discussions ensued. So after the in-room meetings and research review and compilation of data, then those experienced managers began meeting out in the field to actually look at some of what was being discussed. And, dis and for a forester, for a wildlife policy to say, all right, this is the type of habitat I'm talking about. How can you create that? 
a forester to look at and say, I can create that through this type of civil cultural treatment. Those type of discussions were very important. Also important is we recognize in reviewing the management of our properties across the valley was the monitoring that had been done on our properties following treatments. If you go out and treat and you walk away and you don't come back until you're ready to treat that stand again, have you really learned anything from your treatment? We all recognize the importance of that monitoring aspect because going back six months after your treatment's done, going back a year or three years or even five years after, you're going to see whether or not you met your management objective on why you prescribed that particular treatment for that particular stand within your forest and is it meeting that management objective that we originally set. Also, you learn if it didn't, because believe me, we've had a lot that didn't as well as a lot that did, we learned how we could have tweaked it better to have actually met the objectives. So those field-based discussions from those experienced foresters and wildlife biologists were extremely important in developing these desired forest condition attributes. So what we what we started with was primary management factors. Let's focus on if we're managing the forest, the bulk of the folks that are managing the forest for us are professional foresters. So let's talk in their language. And let's look at these wildlife species habitat needs and bring it down to the language that they can talk about and that they can manage the forest in. So those forest metrics were identified, the primary forest metrics were identified as canopy cover, mid-story cover, basal area, and tree stocking. I remember when I first started in my position with wildlife and fisheries, meeting the first year out on some of our WMAs with some of the wildlife biologists that were responsible for those WMAs and asking them what it was they were wanting out of me as a forest manager. And they would tell me, and I would say, well, you want me to like, reduce your basal area to this? Or, and when I said basal area, the strangest look came across their face because not many of them understood what basal area was. I began to understand at that point in time it was a language barrier that was presenting us from doing the best work we could on the landscape or just in those stands as we managed. That began my process. But anyway, getting back to the primary management factors. The desired stand conditions, those desired forest conditions at the stand level that we're looking for for those four forest metrics are identified there. However, we also recognize in developing this that there, there needs to be some trigger mechanisms. The mechanisms, uh, when you measure those forest attributes, that tell our forest managers when it is appropriate to go in and do another treatment of some sort to bring, those, to bring that forest, to bring that stand back into desired forest condition for sustainable wildlife population. Those triggers represent below or above, if you have conditions below or above the desired forest condition. Because we recognize that forests are dynamic, they're ever changing. The minute we walk out from a treatment, whether it be a clear cut or whether it be a intermediate thinning, that forest changes the day after that tree is cut. It begins another change in its development, very much as John went through. So, we recognize that we're constantly going to have forest growing into desired forest conditions and forest growing out of them. So it's only a snapshot in time that we're talking about, but that, re that relates to some of the inventory and monitoring that we're not going to get into today. But the secondary management factors are those factors that are more important, per se, to some of these primary species of concern. Because it's some of these secondary management factors that are ultimately uh, the decision points for whether that population may be sustainable or not. So once again, we try to identify those through the forest metrics that are easily measured doing a forest inventory. Dominant trees, understory cover, regeneration, especially advanced intolerant regeneration, coarse woody debris, 
and then small and large cavities, and stand in dead and stressed trees. And as a forester, I learned in school the basis, and I think John went over the basis of, of us as foresters, is to maintain the health and integrity of our forest and keep it growing and well stocked. As a wildlife biologist, I understand the need to have some ill health within that forest because the broad spectrum of species that we manage that rely on those forests for their sustainable populations have needs for the different habitat qualities that are associated with dead and dying wood as well as with healthy wood. So we need all those factors within the forest. So those factors were identified and the desired conditions of those developed. Also, those points at which time that may trigger management. When the, when the manager sees that on an average across his stand, on an average per acre, he doesn't have those desired conditions. If it's above or below this point, that's something that we'd like to trigger some management action. Defining that management action, that's up to the forester or the land manager to do, <coughs> not up to this document. So, the take on point here is the DFC metrics represent the forest structural attributes that best describe the wildlife habitat quality that we're seeking for sustaining these populations. What are the management recommendations? Well, if you look at this picture, pretty clear. Let's get out there and do some treatments. Let's get out there and manage our forest. We have a lot more forest that's in need of treatment than we do forest that's in desired condition. The goal of desired forest conditions is developing a structurally diverse forest, diverse in species, age, and diameter. There's no silver bullet prescription. The DFC report is not a cookbook that you can provide to somebody and say, go apply this recipe. Instead, it's a, it's a book of recommendations that professional foresters, professional land managers, professional wildlife biologists can sit down and review and come away with an idea of how they can better manage bottomland hardwood forest to sustain the population of their concern of the landowner objective. The treatments, we've not taken anything away. That's the big thing that I want to emphasize. <coughs> it's not an uneven age or an even age philosophy. It's more a utilization of the appropriate civil cultural tools to meet the habitat needs of the species of concern and the landowner's objectives at the time. Treatments there, basically the single tree, the shelter wood that John talked about, combination that we like to use a lot of single tree and group, and then even some group selection clear cut harvest. So, <clears throat> those recommendations, when we look at a landscape level, John talks about don't just look at the stand but also the forest. Well, let's look at the forest as a landscape level, say 10,000 acres. That's one of the minimal size blocks when we made those decision support models that we focused on as a, as a minimal. The recommendation at that level is that 70 to 95 percent of the forest be actively managed. And that 35 to 50 percent of that actively managed forest be within those desired forest conditions. So what we're, what we're talking about here is kind of going back into, into the old world thought where we're talking about managing on thirds. We recognize our forest, as I said, is dynamic and ever-changing. Let's, let's recognize that and know that we're going to have a third growing into desired forest conditions. If we manage right, we'll have a third to 50% within those conditions. And then we're going to have a third or so growing beyond or out of those conditions. It's important to recognize that those priority species we're talking about, it's a suite of species. 
could be game species included in there, it could be non-game species included in there, but within those sweet, that desired forest conditions that we've identified meet the broadest spectrum of that. Those conditions beyond desired forest conditions in the forest are necessary for another suite of species. So it's not that if we made all the forest into those desired forest conditions, made them meet those parameters, that would be managing the best for all the species. We wouldn't be. We have to have a balance, more or less across. But that balance, because of those priority species, is a little bit heavier in the middle where we'd like to have at least 35 to 50 percent of it in those desired forest conditions. Also, no more than 10 percent of the landscape should be comprised of regenerating forest. Regenerating forest is basically those forests that are greater clear cut greater than seven acres. Because we, we recognize the need in group select harvests to go up to seven acres, depending on the site. And once again, this is all site specific where the land manager has to make those decisions. <clears throat> but maintaining that clear cut below 10% of that landscape level is one way that we feel we're better able to sustain those populations on that landscape level. At a stand level, let's talk about retaining those snags and some stressed or dying stems for cavity retention and development. Even two to four trees per acre of species that you know are gonna be the dominant species, emergent trees. Encourage proliferation of cane on appropriate sites. Everybody says, you want to encourage cane? Cane's an important component in the modern hardwood system that we know. You look back into the literature, there were extensive cane breaks, probably most associated with massive natural disturbances that occurred in the valley, whether it be floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, etc. They have played a big part in the development of those species that are relying on our forest structure. But it's not to go out and plant cane just to encourage it where it does occur. And we do that through the intensity of the treatments that we apply where it's occurring. And then target a portion of most stands for regeneration of shade intolerant tree species through civil culturally induced gaps. We wanna make sure, that was one thing that, that John talked upon was make sure that we have that intolerant uh, regeneration ready to release. And that's something that as managers we have to recognize too because it plays a good part in the sustainability of our pop wildlife populations just as well as it does in the sustainability of the, the commercial value of those forests. Fundamental objective of desired forest conditions implement civil culture prescriptions to attain, retain, and maintain desired standing conditions while operating in a sustainable manner that produces quality timber products. It produces quality timber products. It doesn't maximize quality timber products. The landowner has to make that decision. As John stated, we as managers should utmost be aware of our landowner's objective when we go out there to manage the forest for that landowner. Operating principles, no rotation or cutting cycle. Instead of a cutting cycle, we look at an evaluation cycle. Every 10 to 15 years, we evaluate the forest, the landscape level of that forest, and define through the forest metrics that we measure, where are we relative to meeting desired forest conditions. Primary and secondary factors should be averaged across the stand. We shouldn't think, look at those tables and say we have to have that many on each acre. No, we all know as land managers that's bogus. It's an average across the stand that we're managing. That's what we're seeking. No definitive civil cultural prescriptions exist to guide stand development. Within here, there's not a recipe for Joe's stand in Bolivar County. There's not a recipe for Tim's stand in Concordia Parish. 
but you can take this and you can evaluate the objective that Tim or Joe have in managing and owning that forest and come up with the best recommendation for a treatment to meet their objectives. Multiple treatment entries we feel are often necessary to obtain BFCs. So you may go into a stand with the intent to develop it into the desired forest condition, but because of the condition you enter it, you know it's going to take multiple entries before you get it near those parameters. That's all right. And then all silvicultural tools are available at the, to the land manager and for him to use in his stand level management decisions. That's important because a silviculturalist, as a trained silviculturalist, I know I've fought throughout my career and understood it in my training that we have so many tools that we use. If you use them appropriately and you use them where they're effective to meet your objective, then there's no reason for people to take them away. And that's something that we've been guarding. And we may be dealing with more as society becomes more conscious about the lands that we have and what we're trying to do to meet the wildlife population sustainability factors that they put on us. So this is just a, a one shot of a complex multi-layer forest which was produced through variable intensity type harvest. That's one of the desired forest conditions. It's just one. These are some of those attributes that we define in those tables that we're looking for. The small and large cavities, the snags, the coarse woody debris that's lying on the forest floor. Many times that's something that we have to, to actually promote if we're going out treating because as foresters we're trained to clean up that. Basically like cleaning up our room. Leave it in better shape and leave it growing with the most healthy and vigorous trees. It's changing, changing the way we think about the forest, making sure that we're considering those other resources that are dependent on the forest, not just that final product that we want from a quality timber standpoint. So in closing, just to summarize the PFC attributes, explicitly link wildlife needs to the structural forest attributes. Remember, our trust we're, we're the ones that are entrusted for the wildlife resources of this nation, of the states that we represent, of the entities that we represent. DFC attributes are not intended nor expected to occur on every acre of a stand or forest at any one point in time. The report puts forth management recommendations for wildlife species while recognizing the need to maintain commercially viable and sustainable forest product production. DFC reports put forth recommendations, not guidelines. Everybody always gets the hair raised up on the back when we start talking about guidelines because nobody wants to be hemmed into a particular area. That's the beauty of this. It gives a lot of parameters to work within. And once again, it doesn't take away any of the tools. And if not one thing I've learned that's been extremely important through this development of this report and this whole exercise, and it's something that I commend to Andy and Bruce for putting on this symposium, mini symposium today, is to encourage the talk that we need among us as professional land managers, whether we be a forester or whether we be a wildlife biologist, a landowner, or researcher. We have got to communicate, and we've got to communicate communicate clearly and effectively if we're going to do the best for our resources. And with that, I'll end it. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk to y'all. I appreciate the symposium opportunity y'all present. I hope everybody will come back tomorrow and participate in the plenary. Any questions for Mr. Rebecca? Yes, sir. Uh, Kenny, when when you showed the slide of the Mississippi alluvial valley, and you showed the public, publicly held forests, whether they were state or federal, do you have any idea 
the ratio of public acres versus private acres, forestry, forest uh, stopped acres in that slide area. Obviously, I know you don't know the mere statement, but what would you think a ratio would be? Well, and, and this would basically be yeah. <laughs> from my management experience working in the valley and some of the guys out here that have been working with us may know better. But I would easily say if you'd asked me that uh, 15 years ago, that most easily 75 to 80% was public ownership. Some of these programs that we talked about, especially WRP and even CRP in the valley, have had a definite impact to where some of that is being returned to the private landowner. And that's important because private landowners are extremely important sustaining these wildlife populations of concern because as a as a private entity you have greater control and greater ability to not only apply different treatments but also apply things in a more expedient manner when necessary and that's important to us and that's why we have in my agency one of the <coughs> programs i have is my private lands program because we recognize the importance of our private landowners out there on the landscape so having Having that ownership out there is extremely important. But our focus, because of the extensive amount of public ownership in the valley, is of course to, to build upon that. And you'll notice when you look at that model that you referred to, the building upon that, you have the core of public property, but the part that's being built is private property that's being added around there. Rebuilding forest structure on private property. But the original need by those list of partners that you had were for forest areas that they controlled and that they had some concerns for uh, habitat sustainability on those areas? That's Primarily right. due to those public areas moving towards maturity? I'm just trying to get I, a, I think that's, broad brush here. I think that's uh, an easy synopsis of some of the situation we were dealing with. We definitely had I use myself as an example. When I entered the employer with the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries in Louisiana, we had at that time about 240,000 acres of ownership. The majority of that, probably 95% of that, within the valley portion of our state. That ownership was began to be acquired in '59. I joined the agency in '84. To date, that 240,000 acres had had two timber treatments on it by the time I came in. Now, what you gotta also recognize is a lot of that land that we acquired had been heavily cut over prior to our acquisition. But it was getting to, those, to that point that we needed to begin to do things because it was, as you stated, getting into that kind of closed canopy, non-productive type situation. When I left the forestry program six years ago in the agency, we were almost up to half a million acres of WMA ownership in the valley. So we've continued to add to it and still do today. But our forest program is a lot more aggressive today, where we're actively treating every year acreage through different treatments that we apply. And we're actively monitoring it as well. Yes. Kenny, it's my understanding with the DFCs, if the stand warrants for trying to promote open land regeneration, we can do a shuffle with the uh, shuffle reserve at the fall of the mansion. That's correct. Well, thank you. size and a schedule is tight. We are ahead. We haven't had a break. We didn't know that we would have time for a break this morning. 15 minutes, folks. If you could do that and be back in your chairs. If not, we'll have to send a count on there. I guess you get to sit here then. I think it's very difficult. Um, 
as me and my friends very jokingly, when a, a popular book was reintroduced recently, uh, I talked about the Lorax, began calling me in the gym, the Lorax, when they told me I had a chance to speak for trees. I said, no, that's not the difficult part. Trees are easy to talk for. It's the people uh, that are hard to speak for. And, and as I begin to share with you some things uh, today about landowners, uh, the one thing that I'll note is everything that I tell you uh, will be wrong before we get done talking today. And so uh, all of us in this room uh, know that as we engage uh, landowners, how everyone has differences about and how things are uh, so variant between the different type of landowners. And so uh, for my knowledge, is, is I've got some, some different things I can share within this brief talk. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I want you to respond uh, as we can. Uh, those of you in this room, uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you are landowners? Good. How many of you represent landowners? Private landowners? How many of you represent public lands? Fantastic. And so we see just looking around this room, we've got individuals that fit all three of those categories. We've got some that uh, just fit one, but it's a pretty uh, good representation, uh, pretty equally balanced across this room. And so our, our conversation should be good. Um, today, as we talk, I want to bring a few things to your attention. Everybody in this room, as we get started today, is going to say, those are all things that I know. And I hope that is the case. I, I feel like, to some degree, I'm going to take you back to probably what, uh, for many of us as professionals, was, was probably something that you saw on your first day in your classes. Uh, and it's been something that recently, as I've been, begin to engage in some landowner marketing and some very targeted marketing uh, tests uh, and some research efforts, uh, I've had to refresh my memory on some of these things, and, and so I want to just go through those today, much like Dr. Hodges shared some definitions with us today. I want us to review a little bit about uh, basic landowner statistics, what the demographics of our land ownership looks like in the country, where most of our timberlands are. Uh, we'll talk about some of those things just as the southern region of the United States, and then I'll pick one or two uh, things that we're going to talk about uh, here in Mississippi, and a few of the subject areas we're going to drill into a little bit more specifically. Uh, hopefully we'll round those out uh, with some final thoughts of mine uh, and my personal opinion of, of, of landowners and, and the ones that I represent and the anecdotal comments that many of them have made to me. And then depending on uh, what our time looks like and how difficult they may be, uh, I may answer some questions. Uh, but uh, I assure you we will be out plenty of time for lunch as I'm used to speaking to elected officials and they do not allow you 30 minutes of their time. And so uh, we'll breeze on through this, folks. Um, first, as we get started today, um, I just wanted to show you this, this map, and uh, even in dating back to some uh, data from, from 2005, 2006, you can see the intensities of where most of our timberlands are located in the United States. Uh, very briefly, you can see uh, from a national perspective who owns the forest. Uh, you know, it's, it's often surprising to people to think about that, that some, you know, little more than 50% percent is privately owned or timberlands in the United States and almost two-thirds of that uh, is what I would refer to as the family forest or non-industrial private landowner. Uh, and so as we um, talk about those things in our profession, it's very, uh, it's very surprising to some. We break that down more to the, the southern part of the United States, just a little bit smaller map to let you see where those, um, where those intensities lie and their, their timberlands. You can see some of the the area which we're here discussing today is some of the um, the wide area in there. As, as we know, um, we've increased in, in our timberlands in those regions, but still, uh, that's not your greater intensities as it shows up regionally. Uh, one thing I would, would have you note know here is just a little bit about the species breakdown. In terms of Mississippi, I want to talk to you um, we had a question earlier, and this won't answer specifically, Norman, I believe you asked a question about what percent was public, what percent was private. You know, as a state, we, you know, rough numbers can say 70% is, is private, non-industrial. Um, you know, we, that may or may not be something that, that's specific region-wide, but we do know as a state, we're looking at some 70% that is non-industrial. Uh, another just shy of 20% would be uh, government of some kind. Uh, and then our forest industry is small, uh, 12 to 14 percent usually. Um, obviously, um, hardwood being the largest component of that, which, which is very interesting uh, in itself. And so let's talk about how this is distributed. Um, 
when you look at the size of holdings uh, across the country and what percent of the land fits into parcel sizes, uh, when you look at what percent of the ownership is within that um, a given uh, parcel size, uh, you, you definitely see kind of strong through the middle uh, from 20 to 500 acres. Of, it's pretty pretty good balance there of, of land block size. Uh, again, remember this is across our country, but then uh, the percent of ownership because it's nationwide uh, skewed more heavy to the, the, the smaller size holdings. Uh, just as you would expect uh, from a southern perspective, um, somewhat similar because such a great percentage of the nation's timberlands in the, in the south. And so we see very similar trends uh, for the southern distribution as we would for the entire United States. But when we look at Mississippi, we begin to see things a little bit different. Uh, one thing that, that I always point out and when I talk to people about this slide is, is, is what percent of land is broken up into smaller size holdings. Uh, but yet our ownership, we find more of our owners here in Mississippi uh, than regionally or the United States that do own a larger total amount of, of property. And so uh, what this tells me is that many of our landowners aren't necessarily owning this in contiguous acres, uh, but we see here in Mississippi, very many of our landowners uh, that may have small parcels scattered out across the, across the state. Um, additionally, I, I've included a, a small map for us here a uh, very similar map uh, that Kenny had, other than Kenny just uh, had the, the surrounding states and the, they may be there. And so one thing you'll see is those public and private lands, obviously more public uh, listed on this map uh, to, the, to the point of the question earlier. Uh, but we do know through conservation efforts, uh, since this map was done, we have seen those continue to rise in terms of their intensity. What do the demographics of those look like? What are those, who are those people? What do they own? How much do they own? Uh, as a nation, you can say our largest age range is in the 55 to 64 age range. Uh, they obviously um, also own the largest area. Uh, you see a pretty good curve there um, in terms of age uh, and area as well. And so uh, the demographics are very much what we would expect. Uh, Mississippi, uh, a little bit different. I have it broken for you at the bottom of this slide into to three groups. Uh, and we're honestly, in my opinion, very much at a breaking point. You see the top end of that at, at a 65 plus um, age range. Some just over 50% of landowners fall into that category right now, but we're really in the midst of seeing that transition uh, out of that 65 plus age range into the 45 to 64. And so I, it's my, my opinion that as we continue to see the transfer of of timberlands throughout not just Mississippi but the south we're going to continue to, to see that number uh, in the 45 to 64 uh, increase and, and I think it's just a matter of a couple of years where we we see it be the one that's over uh, 50 percent the other factor that you have there is obviously uh, the mere nine percent of under 45 uh, those individuals historically have been uh, on the upper end of that and so uh, increasingly quick those individuals are moving into that middle class as the united states i want to talk to you about how engaged our landowners are the graph on the left references landowners that through surveys have acknowledged having a written management plan the graph on the right would acknowledge where landowners who acknowledge is having salt management advice. Now your first question I'm going to go ahead and answer for you is you're going to ask me what is management advice? Well management advice in this study um, was not defined. It could be a professional of some kind, maybe um, you know if it was for forestry, maybe they asked a wildlife professional, uh, someone who had previous forest experience. Uh, for all we know it was somebody who stayed at a holiday and express last night. We really have no idea. And so, <laughs> Uh, we can infer from that what we, what we may, but the one thing that I would note uh, and that I think is important to see is that from the small landowner sizes, uh, as we increase in size, we see a very linear relationship of more individuals have both salt management advice and have written management plans for their timberlands. Before we leave this, I do want to talk about the, the bullets at the bottom. Um, according to our our National Woodlands Owner Surveys and some of our research through engaging landowners, 
it's, it's estimated we have roughly 6% of Mississippians with, with management plans. Uh, but 30% in Mississippi say they sought management advice. And so uh, when you look at how that fits in, uh, we probably have a little bit smaller proportion of people with a, a RID management plan uh, than some of the national statistics. But uh, we have an increased number who sought uh, management advice of some kind. And so uh, I'll tell you, it's been a struggle, I think, in, in the last several years. And there's been a lot of people involved in increasing that number. I mean, that's a number that we've seen climb, the 6% is. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, coordinated efforts through the Mississippi Forestry Commission, uh, some of the county forestry associations, the American Tree Farm System. Uh, we know that there's roughly 3,800 certified tree farmers in the state, probably an additional, um, in addition to them, roughly 3,000 more uh, stewardship farms here in Mississippi that aren't also tree farms. So um, there's some 7,000 landowners there. Uh, that, that have a management plan of some kind or they wouldn't be able to participate in those programs. And so uh, the majority of those, especially for the stewardship forest, are going to be below 250 acres. And so they fit into our smaller landowner categories. Uh, and so of that 6%, we know that a lot have come through those, those areas. Uh, that does leave a pretty good gap, though, when you look at total uh, number of, of management plans that are out there, uh, theoretically, and where they, where they are. Let's talk about why these people own their timberland. What are they here? What, why have they chosen to be landowners? And additionally, what are they concerned about? Uh, these are listed here in ranking order as people responded as landowners. Uh, the number one reason in the United States that people own timberland is beauty and scenery. Uh, number two is family legacy, which is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, privacy, uh, nature, biodiversity. Uh, the one thing that I want to show you on this this particular list is. Uh, about halfway down is land investment, hunting and fishing, and finally at the bottom is timber production. And what we found after this survey, and most professionals will tell you, had land investment and timber production been combined and not been confusing, that that would have been uh, much higher up the list. And so we, we know that that seems to be uh, really the only one that's split, per se, and we feel like it, as a nation that would have moved it a little further up the category. Uh, Oracle list there. The one thing that I want to point out in terms of concerns, uh, you notice three concerns were listed. Uh, they're essentially pretty similar to the three concerns I'll show you uh, among respondents of Mississippi landowners. However, um, I want to specifically point out the keeping land intact for future generations. Let's talk about a couple specific things that were on that list. Uh, let's stay with the United States still. Uh, for timber production, we can see um, the same relationship um, trend that we saw on some previous graphs in terms of timber production and their interest. What we know is, is landowners, as they increase in size, are more interested with timber production. And so our smaller landowners, we definitely see um, have less interest, which would definitely fit into the, the models that we looked at earlier about the number of timberland owners with small land owners and how beauty and scenery moved further up on the list as a nation. Uh, but when we move to those individuals who did respond with beauty and scenery being an important key to why they owned their timberlands, it really didn't matter what size timberlands they owned. That was, that was a similarly responded response regardless of that landowner size. And so I found that very interesting uh, and wanted to, to contrast the two for you today. <clears throat> Let's move to Mississippi. Let's move to something that we're here um, to discuss today. Uh, and I want you to note a few similarities and a few differences from the previous list. Something I want you to note that's very similar is the, the first response, it's family legacy. Uh, it moved up in concerns instead of being number two, it was number one here in Mississippi. But land investment and timber being two and four, with the comments that I made previously for the United States, we very much can make the same correlation that if those two had been combined and not uh, potentially been confusing to landowners, uh, we would have definitely seen those move to, to the first in, in ranking order. Uh, many of the things below, uh, privacy, hunting, recreation, beauty, scenery, uh, we probably could, could find ways to relate and link those two uh, to be very similar. Many individuals have trouble uh, distinguishing between those two, but especially the, the land investment uh, timber production. Let's talk about what people plan to do with their timberlands. Of those responding to the United States, 
Some 80% say nothing. They have no plans. Don't know what they're going to do. Uh, firewood ranks pretty high. When you think about uh, folks when we get outside the southeast, uh, firewood and firewood production is, is pretty important in some areas. Uh, harvesting timber, obviously number three is on 20%. Uh, and then transferring to airs, and you can read the others there. And so um, how that compares to Mississippi, um, note there's still some 50 plus percent folks in Mississippi that have no plans. They have no idea what they're going to do. Um, some say some activity. Uh, harvest timber is a little bit further down. Uh, as expected, the firewood is much further. Um, but when you look at some 20% here having plans to harvest timber at some point in, in the future, but yet if you'll remember back to some of our previous slides that we put a lot of effort in place to increase the number of people with grid management plans in the state, and we're still somewhere around the six, almost seven percent range, and so that's a pretty, pretty drastic difference there. And so, let's summarize a couple of these things before we, before we start to to make some correlations here. You know, it, as a country, half the forest land is privately owned, two thirds owned by ten million families and individuals. One in four families plans to commercially harvest timber on their property. But yet one in 20 have written management plans. Aging family forest, number one concern. Summary for Mississippi. Almost 70% of forest lands currently uh, forested in Mississippi, is, even in a downturn economy, has been a top three industry in the state. Mississippi of certified tree farms does still rank number one. And so uh, that, that number still gained uh, but again, I want to point out that aging family forest uh, component there. And so I want to give you, uh, from my landowners in my brief time uh, engaging in some marketing uh, tests, some of the responses that we're already getting, uh, and some concerns that I have uh, for our landowners here in Mississippi. Uh, because of the, the extreme concern with family legacy, with, the, with that both being a concern and a reason for ownership, uh, we don't have data like we do for management plans on how many people have a plan to pass their property on to another generation or whomever that may be. And so uh, increasingly more often, I find it important that professionals, whether they be uh, forest professionals, wildlife professionals, uh, begin to immerse themselves and become knowledgeable about property uh, transferring to a, a future generation. And so whether that's uh, you, you bone up on those skills and you become a professional in that arena, maybe that's one extreme. Uh, I might suggest that you, you become knowledgeable enough about that to speak intelligently uh, such that you can guide landowners to, to professionals in that arena uh, so that we can see that, that we don't see future segmentation and, and really uh, find ourselves in a situation where we're trying to manage at uh, a landscape level with increasingly more landowners than we already have uh, more than the 300,000 we have now uh, and find ourselves uh, really behind the hay ball on that. And so uh, concern number one for me is, is that aging uh, component. The second is I put two lists up and I saw many people writing frantically trying to, to write those lists down of, of what's important to people in the United States and what's important to people in Mississippi. And what I told you when I walked up here is whatever I said, by the time I got down would be incorrect because landowners are so different. Uh, and every one of you just is nodding as I say, you landowners are so different and you all engage those individuals every day. Um, but as we see um, a couple things going on, I continue to run into uh, the effort to increase the number of management plans, but, but to some degree, uh, we can move that too fast. We can see that move too fast. If, if the plans aren't specific enough that they engage uh, landowners and that they make sure that they that they address specific objectives that landowners have broad approaches won't work uh, that's not going to that's not going to uh, fit uh, the landowners we have here in mississippi because we see uh, such such variability in their desires and, and honestly um, if we went to each of you who raised your hand as, as a timber landowner uh, i dare say that even as a professional uh, we sometimes manage our own personal property different. We manage it to, to, to our liking. And as we visit each other, and whether it's uh, for a weekend at somebody's camp or whether it's an opportunity to, to uh, just do a site visit with our old friends, uh, I guarantee you when you get back in the truck after you left, you think, man, 
I probably wouldn't have done that. And, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean that they're wrong, uh, but that's why our landowners have chosen to be landowners uh, in this country and why they've chosen to be landowners in Mississippi is it's their opportunity uh, to, to set goals and work towards them. Lastly, uh, with the investment in timber production being uh, in the top five, uh, I have a real concern with, with individuals not seeking professional advice. I know some of our extension professionals uh, some of our agency professionals uh, continue to remind me that they get phone calls of uh, after the fact stories related to harvesting. Uh, we've got some of the best harvesting professionals in the country in the state uh, and they do a fantastic job. Uh, we spend a lot of time training those individuals to make sure that they're not only doing a good job in terms of timber management but also in terms of uh, water quality, uh, habitat, uh, and an entire suite of best management practices but it's extremely important uh, that we continue as professionals to engage landowners before those harvesting activities take place. So very much in a nutshell, that's the three things that I would boil down to you that are increasingly important to our landowners here in Mississippi. And as long as you keep them brief, I'll answer a few questions. Frederick, uh, uh, excellent data. Do you have an opinion or, or data on MAB landowners versus the rest of the state, do those preferences different? Absolutely. Anecdotally, um, Steve, we can, we can note that our hardwood timber landowners seem to be more engaged among those that have responded. Uh, we can note that more of them seem to um, have larger land holdings as well. And so up and down that region, we find uh, more opportunity for the larger landowners to be engaged. Uh, and so I would say while my data primarily looks at the state as a whole, uh, and that's not a region that's been broken out specifically in any of these surveys, anecdotally as we speak with landowners, that seems to be the case. And, and that's again, both that um, the ones that are bottom-end hardwood managers, uh, or timber landowners rather, do have more engagement in terms of management plan, whether it's the saw advice category or the written management plan, and that the land block sizes are larger. Thank you for that question. I failed to mention that. Other questions? Yes, sir. I appreciate your your comments for us, and I'm thinking I didn't understand some of the graphs that you showed us toward the last, where the proportions of none plus the proportions of other categories added up to more than 100, and so I, I would like you to explain that to me. Which, so which graph? Tell me, say that again. I just didn't didn't hear you well. You had the the information about what people's plans were for their land. Right. And you said some had none or minimal, and yet when I look at those graphs, right, and totally add up. They, I don't understand that. That's that's a good question, and some of that is in the variability of how the questions were asked. Not everybody in the um, that's the survey that's done by engaging landowners. Uh, from my understanding, I specifically asked that question because we began to look at some of that data uh, regarding our targeted marketing test. It's my understanding that this is a compilation of surveys that compile that data. And so that still doesn't completely allow us to, to go over 100%, but that's the data that they reported. I see. Very reasonable question, I think. Though. Yes, sir. I've worked with the author of some of the survey material, and I think part of the answer is a landowner can have more than one response. Sure. That's fair too. 41 objectives. Okay. So like none would be a category unto itself. They, and then among the other ones they could have multiple. Sure. And they can, and in some of them they allow them to rank those and so there's... Thank you. Did, did y'all try to put a value on wildlife? So, you know, the land owner has a wildlife on their farms where it be them recreating or keeping them out? In, in terms of dollar value, right? Did it, let me rephrase that question. Did we put a dollar value on it in terms of um, its importance? I mean, we the question was just to ask of these, which is important to you. I can see it being intertwined within the land investment, sure, or commercial timber uh, being wrapped all into that. But they probably never stop to realize that the wildlife has value. To ask. You know, a lot of your landowners were 200 acres or less. Sure. And they probably used the land to hunt the land for 
and they never would think about leasing it out because it's there. But if, if, you had, if they had to put a dollar figure on that wildlife, then what would it be? If, if I'm understanding your question to someone state, um, in summary to, to the, this side of the room, uh, where I made the correlation between land investment and timber production, this gentleman would also like to include in that uh, the hunting and fishing category, uh, not necessarily the timber production, but also just as an inclusion. Uh, this study did not reference that um, specifically, but I know I'm looking at at least three professionals in the room that are all wanting to, to reference it. So I would say any of them that would like to. Scott, I'm going to have a little something to say about that in my book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing that you difference in the value of the land between bottom hardwood landowners and uh, pine or, or upland sites, not from the standpoint of timber production, but what they're willing to pay for the land. I don't know that I perceive that they're willing to pay more or less. Uh, I don't necessarily have a perception there, but I do perceive um, that the landowners that I engage and work with that are bottomland hardwood landowners, their, their personal tie to that property, whether it's family property or something that they've acquired, they value it to go to that next generation sometimes more than those who own um, a traditional pine stand and sometimes even up in hardwood. But, but those bottomland hardwood owners definitely uh, speak more to the specifics of passing to an additional um, group of family members. Thanks, Ted. We are on time. That's a good thing. I have good news and bad news, but before we get to that, any and all speakers who have presentations this afternoon who have not loaded them, if you would, come up and see Scott Edwards. Scott's going to come up here now. Bring your presentations before you get lunch. And he'll get them loaded up and we'll be ready to go. We will start back promptly at 1245. So that means you're going to have to be in here a couple of minutes before that. Now for the good news and the bad news. The good news is that it's time for lunch. Second part of the good news is some of you have chosen well in choosing your seats. Others have not. <laughs> <laughs> The order for lunch is to go exit the door to my left, down the corridor, get your lunch, and then trail into the dining area behind us. That means that unless you're very fast over here, you're going to be last. <laughs> Time for lunch.